Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Jeff Bazance. My pronouns are he, him, his, among others. And I'm your service leader this morning. <clears throat> I will be joined by our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison. We hope that you, you in the sanctuary, uh, you online, um, you who are visiting for the first time perhaps, and also you who are watching on YouTube in some future date, we hope that you all feel welcome here. Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritual, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you identify, you're welcome here. I should note that for those of you who are new here, this church is one of two Unitarian Universalist churches in Edmonton, the other being the Westwood Unitarian Congregation in the Park Allen neighborhood. <clears throat> we gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. We recognize that a treaty is an inheritance, responsibility, and a relationship. May this recognition help us to be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our land, and good ancestors to all our children. We are grateful as well to all the volunteers who make this service possible. This list includes the greeters and ushers here in the sanctuary, all the people who do the work to deliver this service online, and those who created this service with words, images, and music. As we begin this special time together, I encourage you to ask your devices to forswear what they do best, that is disrupt, at least long enough for, so that we can all join the service together. Um, and to make sure this service gets off to an inspiring start, we begin with an announcement from Jennifer. inspiring I'll do my best uh, I'm having um, foot surgery two weeks on Monday for excitement in my life and first can I uh, make a little request if anyone has one of those office chairs that has wheels on it um, I have to walk on my heels which is not very easy and, and for getting around in my apartment it would be very useful you've got one Okay, I'll talk with you later, thank you. The main reason is, of course, um, I want to have everything ready for January and February, at least, with the volunteers. And for example, Rosemary said to me as she was greeting, oh, this is such a wonderful job. So we'd like you all to have a chance at a wonderful job. So if you'd like to think of when you could volunteer in January, February, Oh, up to March. I've got it all filled in then. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And those are, those are good jobs. What are the jobs? Usher, greeter. Yeah. Uh, the greeters this morning were especially good, I thought. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, the other announcement, I'll make a brief announcement. There's some wonderful art in the back there. It's by Christine Moat, who's uh, here. And uh, you can look at the art and you can ask her about it while she's here. That would probably be, she would probably enjoy that. So if you have a little time after the service, you might like to take a look. Okay, next we have a time of contemplation and music with this prelude that Karen Mills, newly returned from Portugal, will, will provide us.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, once more. Good morning. So much better. Thank you. Good morning, and my name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation, this Unitarian Church of Edmonton. I'd like to add my welcome to Jeff's. I'm just so glad you're here. I'm glad you're here online, and maybe later on in the week, month, year, or 10 years from now. I doubt if we'll have the, this one up on YouTube in 10 years, but you never know, right? Um, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad you are here. And if anyone would be kind enough to close the doors, I'd be appreciative. Thank you. I have some opening words by Reverend Gretchen Haley. She is the minister in our congregation in Foothills, Colorado. She's a very prolific writer and she writes so many of these and they are always wonderful. And this one is particularly appropriate. You just pull on it, Em. Just pull the door closed. You don't have to do anything. There you go. Just pull on it. There it is. Thank you. So Reverend Haley, she is a prolific writer. And um, this particular one really fit into our theme today of sharing our gifts. Life comes for us in a thousand different ways, undoes plans and upends traditions knocks down the doors of our defense. In a moment, every expectation releases like the in and out of breath. Life is urgent and also unbearably slow and does not take well to our fantasies of control. We gather here to practice surrendering to the waves of grace and grief in song, in silence, and in story. We come to remember the possibility of a larger call that we might offer our gifts with a surprising generosity, that we might release ourselves from the needing to know, that might, we might just simply be present. To, the, to this beauty, these partners, this hope that we make together, come, let us be together in this space, in this time, in the silence of our hearts and with our song and our spirit. And I would like to invite Jeff up at this time to do our chalice lighting. And I'd like to invite Muriel Buttersworth to light the chalice for us. <clears throat> I have a reading selected by Reverend Rosemary to prime our thinking pumps for what will come later in the service. The piece is called Choose to Bless the World by Reverend Rebecca Ann Parker. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse this world. The mind's powers, the strength of, of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. Thank you, Mary. Our opening hymn today is number 1019, Everything Possible. The words will appear on the screen behind me and, the computer, and on the computer screens for those of you online. Please stand as you're willing and able to sing Hymn number 1019.
I am in need of a page turner. Oh, I was so happy when I saw you walk in, Fergie. I knew I'd have a page turner. Thank you. So let's get her going. I, have you been skiing? No. No? Yeah. Yeah, because there's always something. There's always something in them that is, it is for everyone, not just the children. So, and also, just imagine, just imagine if we were here on a Sunday morning and just imagine it. Somebody walks in with like five kids and I'm reading a story. How's that going to feel? I'm getting ready for, the, for the, those families to come in and having us get ready to have special time for the children on Sunday morning because it will happen. I just know it. Okay, where are we at, Jeff? Offering. Okay, I sit down. Church community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the responsibilities of our free church tradition is that we must provide all the financial support for the work of the church. In addition, we also make a monthly contribution beyond our walls. One half of the identified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. Ushers, you can begin. For the month of November, we are sharing our abundance with the Edmonton Food Bank. More specifically, the CBC Make the Season Kind project. It used to be called the CBC Turkey Drive. And I have to tell you a little story here, um, side story. I can remember 30 years ago going with my 10-year-old son, lugging three frozen turkeys into a, where the CBC used to be and um, dumping them into a freezer there. But with the generosity of Edmontonians, the old turkey drive has morphed into something much bigger now called Make the Season Kind campaign. It's not just turkeys these days. If I remember correctly, over $1 million was raised last year. It will kick off early in December. <clears throat> we'll collect some money now so in November so that we're ready to contribute when December rolls around. Uh, I expect that most of us have heard about how food banks across the country have longer lines and more depleted inventories than ever before. Times are tough for lots of us and for our neighbors. I remember when Edmonton's food bank got off the ground. The hope was that it would address some immediate problems, but that it would not become a permanent fixture. Well, now the Edmonton food bank is a huge operation. Clearly something has gone wrong. We're now in a place where the food bank is no longer a band-aid, but rather a necessary fixture for many families. And, and we're in a place where our economic indicators include stock prices and capital growth, but not the length of the lines at food banks. Whatever the causes of, these current situ of our current situation, the food banks need our support. Um, for those of you in the sanctuary, if, we, if you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift, you can always use the envelopes on the table at the back of the sanctuary. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. For those of you online, you can visit the food bank. Ushers. And maybe we could join in singing from you I receive. Thank you for your generosity, your support. With our time, our talents, and our money, we support the work of this community and of this Unitarian Universalist tradition. <clears throat> the uh, topic of the service today is, what are you going to do with all those gifts? As service leader today, I get to reflect a little bit on the topic. The words for the chalice lighting started like this. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. What will you do with your gifts? So the, by starting off that way, the, the author lists some of the gifts we might have to get us thinking. I don't know if gifts is the right word. 
It's sometimes tricky to separate what we are given in one way or another from what we've worked so hard to achieve or to develop. But that distinction to my mind isn't the main point of this text. Whatever we want to call them, skills, attitudes, abilities, knowledge, let's just call them gifts for the moment. I'm betting that Reverend Rosemary will tell us that we all have gifts of one kind or another. Assuming that's true, then a bunch of questions come to mind. How do we go about recognizing these gifts in ourselves? I ask because it seems there are people that people sometimes deny that they even have gifts. They think of themselves as some players with something like an imposter syndrome. Once we recognize these gifts, how do we go how do we learn to value them? I ask because lots of times people have gifts and deny their value. And once we value our gifts, how do we go about nurturing them? I ask because it seems obvious that some people have terrific gifts that never get fully developed and expressed because they're in the wrong environment. And if we get this far, that is if we get through recognizing our gifts, valuing them and nurturing them, how do we use our gifts? For whose benefit? For what purpose? What broad purpose? We can try to answer all these questions like some lone philosopher locked in a room until the, all the answers become clear. That's one approach. Or we can participate in communities where we can be exposed to different views and values, where we can exercise our suspected gifts with some feedback, but without too much blowback, where we can find ways to develop and direct our gifts. I suspect that many of us feel that the Unitarian Church of Edmonton should be and is one of these communities. Or there is another option. Maybe we can just wait a few minutes for Reverend Rosemary to answer all these questions for us. No pressure. I'll get right on that. <laughs> you will. Our next hymn is number 1008, When Our Heart Is In A Holy Place. For those online, the text will appear on your screen. Please rise in body and spirit as we sing together the hymn number 1008. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, for that wonderful reflection, and I will uh, not answer all of those questions. <laughs> maybe some. Maybe I'll give you some ideas of how to answer them. That they're good questions. 
The reading I have chosen to start things off is by Marianne Williamson from her book, A Return to Love. And she is of A Course in Miracles fame. This quote of hers, or this piece of writing of hers, has been quoted all over the place. I think even by Nelson Mandela, I think he quoted it at one time as well. And it goes like this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who are we to, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. You are meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. One of my favorite pieces of writing. And the first time I heard that, I was a little bit dumbfounded, struck silent. At the end of my three-year, 90-credit Master of Divinity at Vancouver School of Tho Theology, we were asked to write an integrative paper. And I use the word asked very liberally because if I didn't, I wouldn't pass. But it was my choice to write it or not. This paper was to encomp encompass all that we had learned, uh, the book knowledge, the pastoral, pastoral care experiences during the clinical pastoral education at Vancouver General Hospital that I did, the grad school experience, all uh, the worships. Every Thursday we had worship together, all the music. I was the music director there for a couple of years, all the relationships I made, all the field studies. I worked with two congregations, three, maybe four on the lower mainland and was, did a whole bunch of work studies for Vancouver School of Theology. So how in the world was I supposed to take those three years and write a paper and say, this is what I learned, this is how it changed me. This paper <laughs> was given to three professors of my choice and then two people in the community, in my community, to review and form an evaluative panel. You know, I tried to find it on my computer as I was writing this, and I, and I can't. Um, so I was kind of sad about that. I was really interested in reading it again and hoping that I can write better than I did then. But anyway. Um, so one of those people that I asked to come and be my evaluator was the Reverend Samaya Oakley. And she is the new minister in um, Calgary. She just started there this year. Her and I go way back, uh, long before I started in formation. Well, so she was to come to this panel with comments and questions. And it was sort of like a defense in some ways. I gave them this paper, they had a lot to say. And her comment to me, and I will never forget it, or one of her comments, and it's the only one I remember, she said, you've done a really good job telling us what you know, what you did, how you grew, and how you ready yourself, readied yourself for parish ministry. But not once did you mention your gifts. Can you talk about that, she asked me. I was stumped. I did not have the ability at that moment to come up with very much. I probably blathered a bit and said something like, well, I'm a genuinely warm person. People like me, I think. And I, and I can play a mean hymn on the piano. 
and then probably trailed off. And then I started thinking about it this week, and I'm not sure I can rattle off too many of my gifts even now. I'm kind of like that t-shirt. I just do stuff and know things. I might have said something about my homiletics prof, though, who, who said I was a gifted sermon writer. And because I had won the homiletics award that year, I, I might have said something about that. I'm not sure I would say much different now. What about you? What are your gifts? Can you name them? Do you know what they are? Do you allow others to benefit from your gifts? It is a distinctly Canadian, and I'm learning more and more, a very Edmonton thing to keep, our, keep things to ourselves. And also, I've been learning is to say, everything's fine, it's fine, everything's fine, when actually it's not. Have any, has anybody else noticed this trait of Edmontonians? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> oh well, we'll fix that, shall we? Anyways, what a tremendous amount of change we have been through, haven't we? And a tremendous amount of work. This congregation has gone to get through a change in minister twice, get through the pandemic, and since then have been through other changes. One of the biggest things that has changed is that the good folks of UCE are now in covenant with one another, with me, and with the congregation as a thing, as an entity. So we are all in covenant individually. You, as a congregation, is in covenant with me as your minister, and we are all in covenant with UCE. You might be wondering what being in covenant actually even means. And what happens when we fall out of covenant with someone? And one thing you might wonder is if we can still talk about someone behind their back if we're pretty sure they won't ever hear about it. The answer is, of course, no. Being in covenant in a congregation means that if you have a conflict, disagreement, or are upset with someone, you speak to that person first. You don't talk about it in an unkind way to anyone. You might need counsel around it, so a conversation might be with a trusted person, and it might be myself or the board president, and it would go something like this. So, Reverend Rosemary, this thing happened, and I'm, you know, I'm really upset about it, and, and I just don't know what to do. Can you help me resolve this problem or help me find someone to talk to? That is not out of covenant. That is you trying to stay in covenant. However, if your problem is with me, you might not want to phone me up, or, your, or you might. I'd be great if you would, but you might not want to phone me up if the problem is with me, if I have done or said something to you that upset you, or if you had feedback for me. I would love to get your feedback, and I would love for you to come and talk to me. But if you're too nervous to do that, please go and see someone on the Committee on Shared Ministry. They are Ellen Logan, David Ray, Doug Eastwell, and Wendy Smith. If you need help finding them, call up the office, and Janet will put you in contact. So, what does sharing our gifts, being generous with our gifts, have to do with being in covenant anyway? There's another good question. I'm not answering any of your questions, Jeff. I'm just going to say what I want. <laughs> I won't push the cotton. No. A covenant provides safety. Having a covenant means that people will not be cutting others down behind their backs talking unkindly about them, shirking them like Brian was in our story today. In our story, Brian had beautiful gifts to share, didn't he? He's a wonderful artist, a kind boy, but he was unable to do so because he was excluded and treated unkindly. When we aren't used to living in covenant, we do these things to one another. We all do, every group 
anybody, everybody, myself included. I'm not perfect either. P far from it. If you have gifts to share and you've just overheard someone being unkind, are you going to stick your neck out? I doubt it. Try something? Get involved? Nope. Because it wouldn't be safe. Our covenant allows us to relax a little, reveal more and more about ourselves to one another, spend more time together. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. What do you think is your greatest gift to this congregation? Any answers? Fergie, absolutely. I agree with that. <laughs> absolutely. Anything else? What are the greatest, what do you think is your greatest gift you can give to this congregation? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Erica says her big mouth, and I'd like to reframe that by saying <laughs> great idea. Erica would like, her gifts are great ideas, a willingness to discuss conversation. Anyone else? Time. Time. Hi. Hi. Yes. Yeah. And you, Allison. Yes. Anybody else? One more. Presence and commitment, Audrey. Hugs. hugs. Audrey gives good hugs. In quantum theology, my favorite theology, by the way, we learn that no one can be a passive observer. Our very presence changes the experience for everyone. So if we decide we aren't going to go to church because the topic isn't our favorite, we are changing the experience for every single person there. You cannot be a passive observer of anything. Your observation changes the thing that's being observed. That's quantum theology and just plain old quantum, which if anybody understands quantum, I don't believe that they actually understand it. It is so tricky. But, uh, and I certainly don't understand it on a molecular level, but I love it. You are not allowing the gift of your time and presence to enhance the experience of others if you decide to not be here. Maybe the conversation at coffee afterward could change things for someone. Maybe you'll meet someone and your life will be better. In quantum, our observation of something changes the something. It's a little weird and spooky, and I'm not very good at explaining scientific things, but I know that when people get together, when we put ourselves out there, when we offer our gifts to one another, there is magic in the air. I consider this year to be a building year for UCE. We are getting some systems in place. We are learning what living in covenant means. We are getting used to being together and getting reacquainted after COVID. And we are looking to the future with new vision and mission statements. Does anyone know what UCE's vision statement is? I'll read it for you. I had to look it up. We open our doors to all seekers of spiritual growth and nurture positive change for a just and healthy world. What do you think we need to live into our vision? What gifts are we offering seekers of spiritual growth? And how are we nurturing spiritual change? What gifts have you got that you would like to share so that UCE can live into its vision while adhering to its covenant? It is not our darkness we fear, but our light. As a late bloomer, I didn't even know I had gifts to share that could possibly make the world a better place. I offer you my gifts to the best of my ability to make UCE's vision statement a reality. But I am only one.
I wonder if we can all make that promise or think about making that promise. Can we offer a gift, some gifts, a few gifts, lots of gifts, to make UCE the best it can be? But first, it has to be a safer space, and thanks to our covenant, it is becoming safer all the time. And then, to get the systems in place that will help things run a little more smoothly and help those who are new find their footing and get involved. The greatest gift we can be, the greatest gift we offer is the gift of a liberal congregation that offers community, spiritual guidance, nurturance, activities, services, and acceptance. We have so much to offer this world. There are so many places spewing hate and telling people they have to be a particular way, look a particular way, think a particular way, and yet here, we can be generous and welcoming to those that need us. We have a lot to offer, and I want you to remember that. Those gifts that you have of treasure and talent, those are needed, of course. However, somebody said time, it is the gift of your time that is more precious than anything else. I encourage you to spend time with one another before and after the services, to come to the Friday evening event, even if you don't like board games or karaoke, because it's not about the board games and the karaoke, which we're doing this month, karaoke. I'm very excited about that. It's about being together and offering your gifts to one another. And why is that, you might ask? My answer to that would be because the very most important thing in life is relationship. People yearn for and need to be in relationship with one another in whatever form those relationships take. We are social creatures that need community, and here we have a splendid community that we can work to enhance. Or we can sit back and watch. Coming to the Sunday morning service isn't about what you get. It's about allowing your experience, your presence, to enhance the experience of someone else. It's not the same without you. I'm not saying you should come to every service, but I wish you would. Although, I do. <laughs> but you know what? It's not the same without, without you. You are missed when you aren't here. It's, it's kind of a, a, a switch in our way of thinking. We, it's important to think about coming to church not for what you get from church but because you are needed here for the other people that are here. It's kind of a, in our brains, a different way of thinking about it. The flow of energy needs to be more toward one another, not between you and me. Your generous gifts for, are for each other. And as you begin to share them more freely, Wonderful and, pardon me, wonderful and amazing things are going to happen. I'd like to leave you with a quote by Antoine de saint exupéry If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather Teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. What is the endless immensity of the sea that is the Unitarian Church of Edmonton? And what gifts are you willing to share generously in order for that to happen? You are responsible to one another. You have a part to play. May you be brave and honest and giving in your generosity. So may it be. Amen. 
I'd like to invite you into a time of reflection and meditation for a moment. Afterwards, we will sing, How Could Anyone? Okay. So I'll, I, have, I have a poem by Lynn Unger. I'll read a couple of times. First, I'll, I'll take a few breaths together, and then we'll have some silence, and Karen will bring, it, bring us into the hymn, and we'll sing it through twice. During this meditation time and the singing of the hymn, we're going to have candles after. And if you would prefer to light your candle during this meditation time, please, please do so. It's fine. It's all kind of meld melding together today. Meditation, hymn, meditation, hymn, and candles of joy and concern. So I invite you, and always by invitation, never by demand. I invite you to rest your eyes, soften your gaze, close your eyes if that's what feels comfortable, and take a couple of deep cleansing breaths. Allow the chair to hold you. Give it permission. Let your weight sink into it. Follow your breath as it goes through your nose or mouth and into your body. And imagine, if you will, all the cells in your body greeting the air that you need, taking what it wants and letting the rest go, just as we do in life. The Way It Is, by Lynn Unger. One morning you might wake up to realize that the knot in your stomach had loosened itself and slipped away, and that the pit of unfulfilled longing in your heart had gradually and without you really noticing been filled in, patched like a pothole, not kind of, not quite the same as it was, but Good enough. And in that moment, it might occur to you that your life, though not the way you planned it, and maybe not even entirely the way you wanted it, is nonetheless persistently, abundantly, miraculously, exactly the way it is. And I'll share a few moments of silence, and then I'll let you experience that poem once more. One morning, you might wake up and realize the knot in your stomach has loosened itself and slipped away, and that the pit of unfulfilled longing in your heart had gradually and without your really noticing had been filled in, patched like a pothole. Not quite the same, but good enough. And in that moment, it might occur to you that your life though not the way you planned it, and maybe not even entirely the way you wanted it, is nonetheless persistently, abundantly, miraculously, exactly the way it is. We'll have a few moments of shared silence, and then Karen will bring us in. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful?
sing that again, only just humming. This one is empty if you want to move over, a couple of you. And as Jeff lights the last candle for all those joys and concerns that uh, remain unthought of, unlit, not yet in our knowing, and also let us think about and take notice of all these candles burning brightly and on the screen behind me, knowing they're not just little tea lights that we get at Ikea, but they are part of the gifts of one another that we give. Our love, our care, our concern, our gifts. So may it be. Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn. I don't remember the number, but I think it's 118. It is 118, this little light of mine. Let it shine. You knew that was coming, didn't you? <laughs> Please rise and body our spirit.
I invite Muriel again to extinguish the flame, if you'd like to, Muriel. As the chalice is extinguished, consider these words selected by Reverend Rosemary. They come from a piece called May You Be Filled by Eric Williams. May you be filled with the blessing of this covenanted community. May you carry them with you as you depart from here. May you discover the places in the world where these blessings are needed. May you have the courage to share them. May there be an open place within you to receive the blessings of the people whom you will meet along the way. Thank you, Mary. And I offer you these words of benediction. It's called A Holy and Generous Love by Alina Westbrook. Go in hope, for the arc of the universe is long, and we can bend it toward justice. And go in courage, for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and in the wider world, and go in love because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our world. Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace. And now let us gather and sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. If you are new, we do this topsy-turvy circle, and we, sing hand, we hold hands if you want. And we sing. <laughs> 